folks. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Federalist Files. We are going to go over Federalist number 48. It is titled, These Departments Should Not Be So Far Separated As to Have No Constitutional Control Over Each Other. Uh, it's written by James Madison. February 1st, 1788. Topics include separation of powers, intermixture that puts restraints on all three branches, and the legislature is more powerful than the other two branches. So the last paper, Madison went over how there should be a distinct and a separation of powers to an extent, and in this one he kind of he, he goes over that again as well, but he's going over how there should be some sort of a uh, co-mixture of the powers to work as a safeguard against one power, one branch getting more powerful than the others. So the theme of this paper is to prove that the proposed constitution will have a separation of powers, but it maintains that there's going to be enough of a blend in those powers in order to provide each branch with restraints over the other two branches. So he starts off, he states, and I quote, it was shown in the last paper that the political apothem there examined does not require that the legislative, executive, and judiciary departments should be wholly unconnected with each other. I shall undertake in the next place to show that unless these departments be so far connected and blended as to give to each a constitutional control over the others, the degree of separation which the maxim requires as essential to a free government can never be in practice be dully maintained. End quote. So the political maxim uh, that is to say that each uh, branch should be distinct and separate from each other, that political maxim in and of itself, he says, it can never in practice be dully, main, dully maintained. So theoretically, yes, it sounds good on paper. When you hear about it on parchment, it sounds good. But in in practice, it's, it's impossible. It's also impracticable. So Madison next, he states, and I quote, It is agreed on all sides that the power properly belonging to one of the departments ought not to be directly and completely administered by either of the other departments. It is equally evident that none of them ought to possess directly or indirectly an overruling influence over the others in the administration of their respective powers. So this is what he discussed in the last paper. But what he's saying is that we should not have one power, one government agency, or one branch, rather, one branch of the government that is also has full power over another branch of the government. But it's also equally evident that none of them ought to possess directly, indirectly, uh, any overruling influence over the others in the administration of their powers. And they cannot completely be administered uh, alone. It's just, it's just not possible because then it just, it, you get into this, you get into this argument where you say, okay, so to get judicial, then you would actually have to have a direct democracy all of the time. You'd have to have a vote on legitimately every single representative of the government, everyone that is to work for the government, whether it's a judicial, the judicial branch, if you're looking at Supreme Court, the Supreme Court uh, justices, then you would have to have a vote for every single justice every single time it's open. And it's just not possible to uh, have a direct democracy that way. I mean, maybe now with technology, if you had internet voting, maybe it would be somewhat possible, but that would also be not of the Republican character. It would be a majority rules. That's what that's what's funny is when you hear the idea of, uh, especially the Democrat Party talks about it all the time, oh, they're trying to overthrow our democracy, we need to retain our democracy, this country, it is technically not a democracy. It is much more of a republic with democratic means of voting systems in certain specific government positions. If you had a demo democracy, a direct democracy, a complete and whole entire democracy, then you would have a mob rule. And that's the reason why we don't have a democracy. It's the idea that the mob always rules. It is what has happened throughout the history of Europe when one group would take over and then they would kill the other group or they would oppress the other group and they would send them to the the guillotine. So that, that's the reason we do not have a direct democracy. If we had a direct democracy, then it is whatever party is currently in power will turn around and oppress the other parties because there is no constitutionality or a republic to 
to represent that minority party and to protect the rights and the freedoms of that minority party. So that's the reason we do not have a direct democracy. And they knew that. They knew that coming in and writing the Constitution, framing the Constitution, they were aware of the the woes that had taken place in Europe. So he goes on here. So <clears throat> He states, and I quote, This is the security which appears to have been principally relied on by the compilers of most of the American constitutions, but experience assures us that the efficacy of the provision has been greatly overrated and that some more adequate defense in indispensably necessary for the more feeble against the more powerful members of the government, the legislative department is everywhere extending the sphere of its activity and drawing all power into its impetuous vortex, end quote. So here, actually, what he's doing is he's fearing, he, he's accentuating that the legislative branch is the most powerful of of the three branches in the Constitution. Uh, and this is, he states it, that some more adequate defense and indispensably necessary for the more feeble against the more powerful, so, so members of government, of the government. So... He knows the legislative branch is more powerful than the other two, thus making this constitution where there's certain parameters and safeguards to protect the executive branch and the judicial branch as well from the legislative branch. So Madison, he continues to explain that in Republican government, it is always the executive to be feared, but the real power is in the legislative branch. They hold the most power under the proposed constitution to determine funding and salaries. Thus, the legislature has the power to determine the extent of size and power of the other two branches, which is, this is, this is true. And they also have the power, which I don't think he mentions, but the power of impeachment as well. So he states, and I quote, A respect for truth, however, obliges us to remark that they seem never for a moment to have turned their eyes from the danger to liberty, from the overgrown and all-grasping prerogative of a hereditary magistrate, supported and fortified by a hereditary branch of the legislative authority. They seem never to have recollected the danger from legislative usurpations, which, by assembling all power in the same hands, must lead to the same tyranny as is threatened by executive usurpations." End quote. And what he's what he's referring to here is you had a system, a hereditary monarch. I think he's. I think actually what he's referring to is Great Britain. He had a system where the legislative branch was appointing the executive, who was a monarch, and in turn the legislative branch controlled both the legislative branch as well as the executive. And that's the tyranny that's never spoken of, and that's the tyranny that's never actually feared. But the tyranny of a legislative branch is uh, can be much more pernicious than that of an executive branch because the legislative branch once again they hold the purse they hold if, if the if the executive wants to have a standing military they cannot have a standing military if you have a legislative branch that decides not to give him the money to do so it's impossible then unless if people actually felt so loyal to the executive that they're willing to take up arms to fight for him and leave their families in shambles which they're not going to do so after discriminating, therefore, in theory, the several classes of power, as they may in their nature be legislative, executive, or judiciary, the next and most difficult task is to provide some practical security for each against the invasion of the others, end quote. So now he's going to go through uh, the safeguards or how there should be safeguards, and then I think he gets much more into particulars. Maybe I think it's in the next paper. And this is where we're really going to start rolling, because I think this is, what, this is 49 we're doing here, or 40, 48? I believe this ends around 51, just these ideas, and then he starts actually going into the independent branches of government and the two chambers of the legislature. So we're going to we're gonna start getting into the meat and potatoes of the fundamentals of the Constitution and the layout of our uh, our branches of government. So let's see where I am here. I think I lost myself. So after, so, oh yeah, Madison, he points out the deficiency in the wisdom of the founders of republics. They view that the legis that the executive magistrate poses the greatest danger to liberty. They never ascertain the danger from legislative usurpations of power. He goes on, he states, and I quote, In a government where numerous and extensive prerogatives are 
are placed in the hands of a hereditary monarch, the executive department is very justly regarded as the source of danger and watched with all the jealousy which a zeal for liberty ought to inspire. In a democracy where a multitude of people ex exercise in person the legislative functions and are continually exposed by their incapacity for regular deliberation and concerted measures to the ambitious intrigues of their executive magistrates, tyranny may well be apprehended on some favorable emergency to start up in the same quarter. End quote. This is a pretty significant quote that he has here. He's saying, in this system, in this government's proposed constitution, we have a zeal for liberty uh, that we watch out for the executive department to protect our liberty, uh, but... In a democracy, there's a multitude of people that exercise in person the legislative functions. And in having that, they have an incapacity because there's so many of them and there's there's so much, what's the word exactly that, that they use? There's so much diversity, really, of thought that it incapacitates them almost, that they cannot concert together and they cannot collude together to go against the, to go against the people themselves. And they also, by, by also being there too, is it's harder for them to concert with the executive magistrate as well. So it also, it works as a protection. The legislative branch, just because they are diverse and there's so many of them from so many different places in the country, they're diversified in the way that they can't really agree on one thing if they decide to take the rights of the citizenry. So that's a safeguard to begin with there against themselves. The legislative branch protects itself against itself as well as protecting against the executive branch, because if the executive branch wants to usurp his power, he does need the concert of the legislative branch. But if the legislative branch is so diverse and there's so many opinion, they're so highly opinionated and they all disagree with each other, then they're not going to be able to fully organize with the executive branch. And that's kind of the point, I think, of the House of Reps only having those two years, two-year terms. And they hold the power of the purse and all of that, so them holding those two-year terms makes it very unstable uh, in terms of if they wanted to go against the people, they would instant, the very quickly they would be voted out of power. There's a very short window if they wanted to build up a standing military where they really would not be able to, to appropriate the funds and do so. So he goes on next. He states, and I quote, The legislative department derives a superiority in our governments from other circumstances, its constitutional powers being at once more extensive and less susceptible of precise limits, it can with the greater facility mask under complicated and indirect measures the encroachments which it makes on the coordinate departments. It is not unfrequently a question of real nicety in legislative bodies whether the operation of a particular measure will or will not extend beyond the legislative sphere. End quote. This is this is very interesting. So what he's saying here is he's saying they have a superiority to the legislative branch. And since there are actually so many of them, we have more to fear from them, not because there's so many of them, but there's so many of them that there really is not a precise face on who they are. There's not a representation of who they are. You have the president of the executive branch, and they are a representative, figurative head. They really head the entire executive branch. They're one person that holds all of that power. In the legislative branch, you have 435 members of the House of Reps, and then you have 100 Senate members, thus making it 535 members just of the legislative branch. So there is real no, really no face to the legislator, the legislature. And because of that, it's harder to blame them for things that happen in the country, where a lot of the time we should be blaming them for a lot of the problems and the issues we have, because they're the only medium that can solve a lot of the problems, but people don't know anything about our political system, and they always think that it is the president that is to blame. And I'm sure a lot of the blame actually does fall on the legislative branch, probably even more than the president. Unfortunately, now the legislative branch has delegated a lot of their powers to the president, so they'll get their, and it's all party politics, unfortunately, so even when Trump was president, it was the same way, but Right now, they'll look at they'll look for Biden and they'll say, well, "Biden administration, what do you guys want to want us to enact as policy?" They look up to them rather than listening to the people and their constituents, and that's because the media does not hold them to account. It does not hold the Democrat Party to account. It does not hold politicians in a general sense to account, unless if they are Republicans. So they won't hold the legislative body to account. 
so the legislature just looks up when they have a majority of Democrats, they look up to who the president is because the president is also a Democrat. And then that's how they enact. And that is how they start writing policy. It comes straight from the top down. Whereas it should be the legislative branch should, should open their ears up to the people themselves and what kind of policy they want to enact or what kind of policy they actually want to uh, eradicate. But that's just not how our system, unfortunately, that's not how our system works. And once law is passed for example when a relief bill gets pushed through and they see a bunch of pork in the spending a bunch of bs if you talk to the regular american that doesn't know anything about politics they think it's the president's fault whereas the legislative branch is the one that is appropriating all those funds at the end of the day the president only signs off on it so they have their own discretionary power to follow through or not and and they choose to ha ha take our money, our taxpayer dollars, and just give them to other countries. That's the choice of the legislative, the legislative branch. And I think it's very interesting at the very end of this quote he writes, it is not unfrequently a question of real nicety to legislative bodies whether the operation of a particular measure will or will not extend beyond the legislative sphere. Almost, almost saying is when the legislative branch goes forward with some sort of a law, it is not really particularly answered if they have the power to even do so. And that's, I guess, for the uh, Supreme Court to answer to. And to an extent, if the Supreme Court decides to rule against what the legislative body wants and the mass of the legislative body wants it, the legislative body can go ahead with articles of impeachment against the Supreme Court justices if they really wanted to. So they really do hold a majority of the power. We just don't see it that way. We see it as the figurehead, the president, it's easier to point at one person. And there's also, the media also makes much more money on dividing the country as well as uh, just reporting what one administration decides to do. It makes much more sense to do that rather than point at all different people that are senators or House of Rep members because people just are not enticed enough with politics or informed enough to know who those people are. So he goes on here. He states, and I quote, nor is this all, as the legislative department alone has access to the pockets of the people and has in some constitutions full discretion and in all a, a prevailing influence over the pecuniary rewards of those who fill the other departments, a dependence is thus created in the latter, which gives still greater facility or yeah, facility to encroachments of the former, end quote. So he's saying there's going to be more encroachments from the legislative branch because there are a lot of other bodies within the government that are reliant on the legislative branch for their positions in government. So you're going to create more encroachments coming from the legislative branch because people are more dependent on them to get their positions of power or to hold their positions. Like, for example, executive, the president can be impeached and so can the Supreme Court justices. Madison argues that an overbearing amount of power in the legislative branch will lead to the same tyranny as is threatened by executive usurpations, end quote. Which makes sense. The more power you vest in one branch, it will lead to tyranny almost inevitably. Uh, it does not matter if it's in one body or if it is in a body of one person or in a body of many people. But if you vest a lot of power in the body of many people, like the Articles of Confederation held with the Congress assembled, that will lead to a feudal, inevitable uh, tyranny. So Madison describes that the executive magistrate is carefully limited and the legislative power is exercised through a Congress that is sufficiently numerous enough to make an impact, but not in a magnitude that would make them incapable of pursuing agendas which is interesting. In summation, because of the extensive powers, extensive amounts of peep, uh, of members, and low amounts of attention it draws, the legislative branch can easily impede the other two branches, which makes sense. Like I said, there's so many, there's so many members, so it's harder for them to draw more attention because there's not one specific person to point the finger at. And there's more, and this is, I guess, why we have the two-party systems, because you make generalizations about one party or the other. So next, Madison takes an excerpt from Thomas Jefferson's piece, uh, notes on the state of Virginia. In this excerpt, Jefferson states in Virginia's government that power from all three branches of government have resulted in the legislature. And this is very interesting. So Jefferson, I believe at this time he actually was a resident of Virginia. And he talks about how their state government works and he, he talks about the problems with it. And he's got some long quotes here, but they're they're well worth your time. So he, st he states, and this is this is the words of Thomas Jefferson the writer of our Declaration of Independence. So he states, and I quote, 
All the powers of government, legislative, executive, and judiciary result to the legislative body. The concentrating these in the same hands is precisely the definition of despotic government. It will be no alleviation that these powers will be exercised by a plurality of hands and not by a single one. 173 despots would surely be as oppressive as one. Let those who doubt it turn their eye on the Republic of Venice, as little will it avail us that they are chosen by ourselves. An elective despotism was not the government we fought for, but one which should not be founded on free principles, but in which the powers of government should be so divided and balanced among several bodies of magistracy, as that no one could transcend their legal limits without being effectually checked and restrained by the others, end quote. So more importantly, he's saying, I guess at this time in uh, Virginia, they had 173 different members of the legislative branch in that particular state, but the legislative body held most of the power. So now it is just a elective despotism or a uh, elected you elected these people but it's still despotic because all despotic or despotism is the idea of absolute power so absolute power as as is famously said by i think a famous philosopher absolute power corrupts absolutely that absolute power is held in the legislative body and even though it is so many people that hold it, it is still at the end of the day despotic power because it is always corrupted so he goes on and i quote for this reason that convention which passed the ordinance of government laid its foundation on the on this basis that the legislative, executive, and judiciary departments should be separate and distinct, so that no person should exercise the powers of more than one of them at the same time. But no barrier was provided between these several powers. The judiciary and the executive members were left dependent on the legislative for their subsistence in office and some of them for their continuance in it. If, therefore, the legislature assumes executive and judiciary powers no opposition is likely to be made nor if made can be effectual end quote so there can be no opposition because from the executive or the judiciary branch because they're they are reliant on the legislative branch to give them their position in the government and give them their power which is also why they made the provision in the constitution that the emolument which is the payout that comes for your job your salary essentially why your emolument cannot be changed during your tenure or cannot be i know for the supreme court it can be changed but it can only be changed positively it cannot be changed negatively since those are considered life's life terms from the executive branch's position it cannot while you are running or while you are serving as the president they cannot change it they cannot take away your emoluments because then you're not you are now if you are running as the president and the legislative branch threatens to take away your pay that is directly in violation of the Constitution because then you are beholden to the legislative branch. You are relying on them from the executive, and now you are no longer a distinct or a independent body. You are just part, you are the same. You are part of the legislative branch because they're withholding your pay to make sure you do things on their behalf. And that's the reason why they specifically made that, that uh, provision in the Constitution. So then he goes on next, he states, and I quote, because in that case, they may put their proceedings into the form of acts of assembly, which will render them obligatory on the other branches. They have accordingly, in many instances, decided rights, which should have been left to judiciary controversy and the direction of the executive during the whole time of their session is becoming habitual and familiar, end quote. So this is very interesting. So what he's stating here is that many scenarios the legislator has decided the rights and the powers to be left to the judiciary and the direction in which the executive branch, as in the governor, should take. Additionally, Madison, he cites the Pennsylvania state government's legislature that committed multiple infractions, such as trial by jury, which had been violated, the legislative branch would go ahead with the bills of a tander. There was no type of trial by jury in criminal cases, which actually now is federally mandated. I think also through, yeah, federally mandated through the Constitution that criminal cases have to be a trial by jury. It is not a bill of a tander. There's not a legislative body that stands there and decides whether you are guilty or innocent. And there's not just one specific judge. You are to be judged by a jury of your own peers for that specific reason, or else you become a tyrannical authoritarian nation. Also, the Pennsylvania state government's legislature, 
determine the salaries of judges, varying them, messing around with them to manipulate the judges' uh, course of action when it came to judging cases, and bills were not printed for consideration of the people, which is a violation of their state constitution. So there was bills, a bill is in the law that they were trying to legislate. They were not making these laws uh, considering who their constituents were, the people themselves. And it's all in direct violation of the state constitution. This is something that was going on in Pennsylvania. I don't know if he mentions this. No, he doesn't. He does not mention specifically. Uh, I know he does. He mentions specifically, but I didn't, I didn't get the quote because I remember the quote being like two paragraphs long. So I just try to summarize it. And now this is him where he goes on to the, uh, he talks about and he lists. Oh yeah, I think he does actually list a little bit about Pennsylvania here. He states, and I quote, First, a great proportion of the instances were either immediately produced by the necessities of the war or recommended by Congress or the commander in chief. So he's talking about all the times where this has been, um, where this has been done in Pennsylvania, where there has been a too much of a co-mixture of powers and why it has happened. So he says, first, a great proportion of the instances were either immediately produced by the necessities of the war or recommended by Congress or the commander-in-chief. Secondly, in most of the other instances, they conformed either to the declared or the known sentiments of the legislative department. Thirdly, the executive department of Pennsylvania is distinguished from that of the other states by the number of members composing it. In this respect, it has as much affinity to a legislative assembly as to an executive council. And being at once exempt from the restraint of an individual responsibility for the acts of the body and deriving confidence from mutual examples or, or f from mutual example and joint influence on authorized measures would, of course, be more freely hazarded than where the executive department is administered by by a single hand or by a few hands, end quote. So he's, he brings up the instances in which there has been a commixture of powers to too great of an extent where it has become tyrannical, and he goes on. It's, it's kind of the exigency circumstances from what he, he states here, and that the Pennsylvania, because the Pennsylvania executive department is distinguished from that of the other states and the number of members composing it is in, I guess, the Pennsylvania... Executive branch had more than just a governor. It must have had a council of multiple people that were all appointed by the legislative branch, thus making it a too much of a commingling of the powers. And there's not that one figurehead. And the reason that there has to be that one figurehead as the executive is they are the commander in chief. They need to be able to quickly and swiftly make decisions in terms of foreign policy, in terms of um, war, for reasons like that. Once again, I, I haven't yet. At this time, I'm recording earlier, but I've yet to cover uh, what is actually going on in Syria, the bombs that were dropped. I don't really know yet, so I'm not going to report on it yet. But the reason that you have bombs being able to be dropped is because of the Constitution. And, and people are claiming it's unconstitutional because of so sovereign countries and all this. If we get attacked, uh, if our country gets attacked, our fellow soldiers, our, our the best that we have, our military, if they get attacked... You can't go through the. You cannot go through the government to get an approval for an airstrike or, or some sort of a bomb strike. You, if you're doing that, then it's going to take too long, and by that time, our country's already taken, or our soldiers and our military are already they're already gone. So Madison concludes that a piece of paper alone isn't a sufficient guard against the encroachments that are indicative of a push towards a tyrannical concentration of all power in the same hands and he says this because pennsylvania had a bunch of things written down where they weren't supposed to be doing what they were doing but they still decided to go ahead with it so he states and i quote the conclusion which i am warranted in drawing from these observations is that a mere demarcation on parchment of the constitutional limits of the several departments is not a sufficient guard against those encroachments which lead to a tyrannical concentration of all the powers of government in the same hands end quote so what he's saying is, just by having it written down doesn't automatically uh, deter different departments from, from becoming tyrannical or different branches from becoming tyrannical or the government from becoming overbearing. What we need to do is we need to set up multiple safeguards to ensure that there is not a encroachment uh, of the power from the, from the federal, federal head and the federal government. Because then once you get in a slippery slope, when you have the federal government committing usurpations of their power and they realize they can get away with it 
with no type of recourse or ramifications, then they will continue to further and further do that and further and further push the envelope and the boundary and see how much they can get away with. Uh, For example, what's currently going on in COVID-19, we're we're now approaching the last, the 15 days to stop the curve. It's almost been a full year since that was the saying. And some states are open, some states are free states, and they don't have to wear masks everywhere you go. Some states have actually increased their tax revenue because they did not close down business. Whereas there's some states that are more tyrannical in their leanings, like in New Jersey, like in New York, and they have some serious problems right now that they're going to have to, uh, they're going to have to handle. So that's going to be it for this one. I greatly appreciate everyone for tuning in. Please drop the mic, let people know about the podcast, like, share, subscribe as always. And, uh, I'm going to see you this weekend on the weekend special. I greatly appreciate you for tuning in. Thank you.